When you go home tonight, after it gets dark, take some time to look up at the sky and see if you can spot a shooting star and make a wish. Because 10, 20, 30 years from now, I'm not sure exactly when, but sometime in that time frame, when you look up and you see what you think is a shooting star, it almost certainly won't be a shooting star. It's far more likely to be the sun shimmering off one of 100,000 satellites that are whizzing past. That sad scenario may be a relatively good scenario among many possible scenarios. The, uh, another scenario may be that it's a piece of space debris deorbiting de through Earth's atmosphere from the collision of two or more of those satellites um, and, and their, their collision causing a deorbit of space debris. An even worse scenario may be that it is a missile actually deliberately destroying a satellite. But the best case scenario, when you look up 25 years from now and you see a streak of light, is that it's a rocket launching from somewhere nearby. In fact, maybe so close in, in Australia, right here, near here, that you can not only see it, you can hear it, you can even feel the rumble. Imagine that. I want to talk some more about this best case scenario before I go on and talk about some of the scenarios that con should concern us all. Because outer space is not just for the scientists, it's not just for government and military forces, it's not just for corporations. Outer space is for everyone. Space enables the smartphones in your pockets right now. It enables networks to work, the biggest of which is the internet. It gives us live TV across the globe. It lets us know the weather uh, tomorrow and the day after and the day after that and understand weather patterns for decades and how the weather interacts with soil to give us more efficient agriculture, L helps us to use the land more sustainably. It facilitates the transport of our consumer goods on ships, planes, trains and trucks. It gives us communications in remote places or on air travel if we're doing that, imagine that. Uh, and it, even in remote places, like maybe an iceberg somewhere. And all of that is just the tip of the iceberg. During COVID-19, for example, space has enabled us to work from home. It's enabled us, it's enabled our kids to work from school and to talk to our teachers down the street, or to other school kids in Europe, America, China, or a remote village in, in Sudan. Space-related projects like the Other Three Billion Project aim to provide connectivity to everyone, everywhere. And that's fantastic, but um, I, it's important to acknowledge the benefits that space provides, because space is, is there for all of us. It's important also to acknowledge that industry provides the benefits or facilitates the things that, that make space work. But globally, the space industry is a fourth, $430 billion industry. And it employs many hundreds of thousands of people. It's set to triple in as little as the next 10 years. That's fantastic. And, and the industry, the people in the industry are naturally doing that sort of thing for profit. But there are also plenty of people in the industry who are doing great things simply because they're great things to do. And also because what you can only imagine today can be done tomorrow. That's fantastic, but I want to tell you about some other things happening. Two things that should concern all of us in particular. The first is physical congestion with satellites and space debris. Between 1957 and 2019, there were 10,500 satellites that have ever been launched. Of those, 3,200 
continue to be active right now. In the next 10 years, Elon Musk company SpaceX, by itself, plans to launch 42,000 new satellites. That's one company. And then there's Jeff Bezos from Amazon, who, who plans to launch 3,200 new satellites. And Samsung plans to launch 4,600. Boeing plans to launch 3,000 new satellites. All of that is, is fantastic. But access to space is becoming cheaper than it has ever been. So satellites are being launched by small startups with just a few employees, by universities, by secondary schools, by primary schools even. Space, it said, is becoming democratised, or another way of saying it is that outer space is for everyone. Uh, that's fantastic, but all of this, every, every new satellite that you put into orbit makes it more complicated to put later satellites into orbit. It makes it more complicated to launch rockets through those orbits, and it increases the risk of congestion, the risk of collisions. That's before you even mention the almost one million pieces of space debris that are bigger than a bullet and ten times as fast. Only less than 5% of those pieces of space debris are capable of being tracked right now. And of those 5%, a proportion are tracked in, in real time. There's a possibility that we could get to something called the Kessler effect, in which one collision causes a cascade of later collisions, and Earth orbits become unusable for decades, centuries, even millennia. Now, there are standards that apply with which every satellite operation, operator has to comply, but they vary from nation to nation. And there's a temptation for one nation to have more lax standards than another nation in order to attract more business to their shores. There are no rules of the road. There's no keep left or keep right, no starboard tack over port tack if you're talking about maritime traffic, no separation minima if you're talking about air traffic. And there's certainly no space cops sitting on a space scooter out there somewhere. The second problem that's happening in outer space right now is weapons in outer space. Now, a lot of people in the audience have probably heard about the Space Force. And maybe you've thought about uh, the officer trainees in the Space Force and whether they might be known as space cadets. Now, that's, uh, it's hard to take it seriously when you, when you think about that, but it is very serious. There is an arms race happening in space right now. The US, the, the Russia, China and India have all tested anti-satellite missiles, missiles that are launched from the ground that are capable of destroying a satellite. And the US and Russia are sharing some of that missile technology with other nations. The US and Russia have also tested nuclear detonations in outer space that cause an electromagnetic pulse. When the electromagnetic pulse goes off, the electromagnetic pulse causes an electronic, an immediate and lingering electronic effect in space and on Earth. And then there's many nations who can engage in jamming of satellite signals and other means of electronic warfare. And that's particularly scary when you think about how dependent computer networks are on the timing signal from GPS, from the GPS constellation. If you disrupt that timing signal, then your internet, your phones, your TV, your train networks, your water grid, your electricity grid, all of those could be disrupted for hours, days, weeks or longer. Imagine no Netflix for several weeks. So, we have laws, rules, 
policies and practices that apply to space, actually many rules, laws and practices and policies that apply to outer space. And ethics applies to everything that we do. And collectively you might refer to these as the norms or normative framework for outer space. Unfortunately, the normative framework for outer space is not keeping up with the pace of activities in outer space. Governments and corporations are taking the initiative to supplement the normative framework for outer space. But it probably won't surprise you to know that those governments and corporations have vested interests, and those vested interests are predominantly related to profit. There needs to be more than just governments and corporations that have a say about the use of outer space. You too need to have a say about how space is used, because outer space is for everyone. Now that's not just a high sounding, but ultimately empty statement. It's actually a matter of law. The Outer Space Treaty, the sort of Magna Carta or constitution for outer space in its very first article, refers to the use and exploration of outer space as the province of all humanity. Now, unfortunately, it's not possible to identify someone or something that effectively represents the whole of humanity. Some people might say that when our governments go to the United Nations that they're representing the whole of humanity. I'm a little bit cynical about that. But one thing I'm certain about is that if you, if me, we all say nothing about how space is used, then humanity has no voice and it'll be short-term vested interests that influence how space is used. Space is a part of all our futures. Whatever your generation, whatever your gender, whatever your race, whatever your religion, whatever your abilities, space is there for you too. And if you care about our children and their children and the generations to come, then you should care about what they see when they look up at the stars. So please, go home tonight, take some time, Look up at the stars, see if you can see a shooting star, and make a wish. I have five words to finish with, because I might not have said it enough. Outer space is for everyone.